We in the FBI, we understand. We met Ren Cannon in a Portland park, a man who I can tell you is more than just a really cool name. He's the special agent in charge of the Portland division of the FBI. I was kind of surprised when we, you guys kind of reached out to us. Why? You know, I, I want to just start the conversation by saying that um, we recognize that the uh, death of Mr. Floyd and others has sparked a, a really important national conversation. He wanted to keep his mask on for our interview, but I think it's important that you see his face. So this is him. It's hard to really know someone otherwise. And I'm sure he can relate, considering this wanted poster. The Bureau has hit what they call an impasse with the investigations into the 10 people you see here. And they've decided to increase their efforts and resources to arrest the people lighting fires and breaking things in the riots and fights with police. And to do that, They've been watching video footage nonstop, like news junkies, to collect evidence. It used to be, not that long ago, surveillance camera video meant one camera on the top of a building kind of pointing downward. Right. Now, you have journalist video, you have activist video, you have people who are bad actors who are showing what they're doing. You have access to all of these live streams and Twitter feeds. How deeply do you get into that video when trying to solve these crimes? It would depend on if it's, if it's, a, if it's assessed to be a, a press, then we would have to go through a procedure to get approval at a very high level and then serve a search warrant. So do we have access to different things? It, it, it kind of depends on the, the video, who owns the video. Um, if it's a surveillance camera that uh, is owned by a government agency, then they might give it to us. If it's a business, then we would go and we would ask. If we have reason to believe that there's information there, then we might serve a subpoena or a search warrant. What if it's something that somebody posts publicly, like a Twitter account, they put a video out, or a live stream that they, you see dozens of those every night at any of these protests or riots that we see break out here or any, uh, anywhere else around the country? Yeah. Do you have, can you look at those? And sure, just like anybody. I mean, we can go and, and, and take a look at open source, publicly posted information on the internet. So we pay attention to the news just like anybody else, and we pay attention to all that. This is a different environment with all the social media. So if it's publicly posted, um, we can take a look at it and we, we, we go through the internet and uh, when there's, there's a predication and a reason to do so and take a look and try to figure out who was it that committed this crime. Would an arson, like the ones you're investigating now, be sure. reach that level? Absolutely. How helpful are those videos that are posted publicly? You know, like I said, it's very difficult in a, in a crowded environment. So that's, that's labor and time intensive. And again, this is why we're asking for the public's help today. Federal investigators use live streams to arrest 24-year-old Dakota Ray Horton for allegedly attacking a federal officer with a baseball bat. Some shots like this one show it happening. Others give you an even better look at him. It led to a sighting a few days later of a male individual in the Rock Creek area wearing the exact same clothing as worn by the assailant. The feds arrested Horton, that's him in handcuffs, smoking a cigarette after his arrest. He was packing a handgun, too, at the time. And the ATF arrested Edward Shinzing for arson. He got busted from videos like these and Body Ink. If you're thinking Shinzing is a unique name, it's an even rarer thing to get tattooed across your back. But if we go back to the wanted poster, videos aren't always enough to arrest most people. In fact, the FBI actually needs demonstrators to turn on those who broke the law. What is your take on the public perception of what's happening and because you have a lot of people who are talking about these crimes, public leaders speaking about these arsons as minor infractions or property damage. What is your stance on that? Well, I, I, as I said, my assessment is at this point, this level of chronic violence, individually I can understand the assessment that's not that serious a crime. The chronic violence is now starting to pile up in terms of the cost to the community. So I would say, when you take a look at how, many, how much money is being spent by city and county uh, and state budgets for these security operations night after night, for repairs, you know, the impacts on business, on tax revenues, all of those things add up, and those are the types of things that we evaluate. So the impact on the community cumulatively is what's prompting us to do more.